Good evening. Welcome to the April 10th Elmhurst Board of Education meeting. Uh, the board has been in closed session since 6 p.m. discussing employment of employee uh, and contract collective bargaining negotiations. Um, I have right now five board members present to temper, well, two, here they are. I have seven board members present now. Thank you. So you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Mr. You can, you can remain standing. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now that we're all here, the uh, first item on our, uh, the next item on our agenda is um, student recognition and the uh, Knowledge Master Open Competition, um, won by Sandberg Middle School. Um, we have Mr. Perneau, do you want to? Frank, you want to come up and? Yeah, just go to the microphone. Welcome, students. It's great to see you. Frank? Good evening. Um, Knowledge Masters Open, or formal, informally known as KMO, is a tradition at Sandburg that goes back to the beginning of the REACH program. Um, it's a way for kids to compete with their brains instead of their bodies, where we learn uh, curricular stuff and then apply that to questions where if they get it right, they get points, and if they get it right faster, they get even more points. So it's a competition that is based upon not just what they know, but how fast they are able to get to, um, to the answer. Now this competition starts in seventh grade. Corey Zock and um, Elizabeth Kornacker help um, teach these kids team building and how to handle such a large group of people working together to come to these, um, to these answers. Uh, I mean, we're talking 66 to sometimes 82 kids. And they all work together to come to an answer and, um, and get points in, in this competition. The, this particular year is bittersweet. It is the last year of KMO. Knowledge Masters Open is closing the doors. And so we will no longer have this competition to take part in every year. So um, for us to take second in the state and 22nd in the world against 508 other teams was a huge accomplishment. So I just wanted to thank the board and the administration for recognizing the accomplishment of these kids. So, thank you. So I have a, a proclamation to read. Whereas the Knowledge Master Open is a challenging academic competition in which teams of students compete nationally and internationally, and whereas the Sandberg Middle School team completed the Knowledge Master Open academic competition against over 500 schools in the US and several other countries on December 5th, 2012, and whereas team members answered questions from all content areas, as well as current events, economics, law, arts, and even trivia, earning points for the speed and accuracy of their answers, and whereas the following middle school students were members of the eighth grade KMO team, placing second in the state of Illinois competition and 22nd in the world, Eileen Bard, Madeline Birch, Sydney Bronthan, Elizabeth Brown, Spencer Bunch Hodling, Ryan Casey, Anders Castor, Casey Cervantes, 
John Solistek, Amy Choi, Burke Cor Corcoran, mm -hmm. Carolyn Cotter, Alexander Crum, Colin Check, Kazia Dragonowski, Jenna Dvorak, Harriet Everett, Sambin Gianelli. Gianelli, Claire Gornick, Jack Gornick, Abigail Grundum, Anna Gutierrez, Andrew Harmon, Evelyn Hogg, Audrey Honing, Gloria, Gloria I'm, I'm sorry, Glory Jacklet, Sam Jordan Wood, Kristen Karowski, Natalie Kasanovich, Andrew Ladd, Emily Landreth, Sabrina Less, Raymond Lessis, Lessis Amy Ledeve, Kevin Lipkin, John Matthews, Madigail McDonough, Megan McGreal, Isabel Miller, Andrew Missimer, Mark Morileo, Maria Mulis, Emma O'Brien, Amelia O'Halloran, Ailey, Ailey Orzak, Grace Q, Kevin Rishwalski, Nathan Rago, Maria Rantis, Julia Riddle, Amy Regala, Colin Sandstrom, Madeline Shea, Thomas Sheehan, Matthew Shiley, Shiley, sorry, Ami Amelia Ciavellis, William Sikich, Adam Skaransky, Nicholas Soldano. Soldano, Barrett Sullivan, Ella Summer, Laura Sussman, Rebecca Torty, Gavin Vandenberg, Juan Vega, and Zachary Wilbur. And it's a big team. That's a big team. It might be the biggest team we have in the district. Whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to Sandburg Middle School, to District 205, and to our community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit District 205 express congratulations to these students, their parents, and their teachers, Frank Dolman. Elizabeth Kornacker, Tracy Morser, Susan Reinheimer, and Z Corey Zock for this outstanding accomplishment. So we have a certificate for each of you, and my apology to every student whose last name <laughs> I didn't do a very good job with. After you get your certificate, what we're going to ask you to do is start with Mrs. Deroni. Start with the first, the first row. Second row is the first row moves on. <laughs> Step forward, and I'm going to ask you to start with Mrs. Deroni and shake hands all the way around the table because we all want to congratulate you.
this point, let me turn it over to, to Mr. Purnell for one more um, student staff recognition comment, and then we're going to have a very short break because I have to believe there's some homework to be done tonight. And, um, and then we'll resume our meeting. Yeah, just one other recognition I would like to share with the board and the public tonight. For the fourth year in a row, Elmhurst District 205 has received the Association of School Business Officials International Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting for its comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ending 2012. This award represents a significant achievement and confirms District 205's commitment to financial accountability and transparency. Recognition through the certificate Certificate of Excellence program can assist a district in strengthening its presentation for bond issue statements and also promotes a high level of financial reporting. The introduction of position control over the past year and a half and other automated tracking measures in the past couple of years have increased efficiency and have led to much better reporting. Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations Chris Weldon credits our internal auditor, Helen Perez, for preparation of the CAF for the fourth year running. And if people are interested, that report is posted on our website under www.elmhurst205.org slash finance. So I want to congratulate Chris and Helen and all of the staff for really an outstanding achievement for four years in a row for the transparency and accountability. Congratulations. We can take just like a one minute break if anybody needs to leave, get some homework done. That includes parents if you have homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we can get back to the rest of the meeting. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is public comments. I don't have any cards here. Do we have any public comments in the audience? Hearing none, let me move on to the superintendent's communication. Mr. Purnell. Yes. Uh at the board's request, Dave uh, Smith is here this evening, and he is going to review the technology funding plan for 2014-15 uh, uh, and the technology roadmap. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and Dave will go through the program with the board. Okay, thank you. Well, first... Um Disappointed that the whole room left right before my presentation, but um, hopefully, I, you know, those of you that remain will um, enjoy. The, uh, what I'm going to overview for you is basically a two-year view of the technology roadmap and budget. Um, it's a high-level view. It's just to just give you an idea of um, overarching um, direction and and, rel and basic cost projections for what this would. Um, what this would involve. So um, hopefully, if you've got questions, you know, answer or just go ahead and ask me right in the middle or at the end. Uh, this slide, uh, the top half of it depicts a trend of expenditures uh, for technology in Elmhurst 205, and it also projects out the what the budgets uh, look like for the next couple of years. The um, the uh, blue and, and red combined is what you see at the top in green. So the green line is the total expenditures. The red line at the bottom represents the O&M uh, expenses, which are telecom and internet service, things like that. The blue is more of everything other than, other than those services, so all the equipment and um, warranties and things like that that we, that we spend money on. And as you can see, uh, there was quite an increase in expenditures um, in like the 08 through 2010 uh, timeframe. Then the grayish area is where we started to 
bring in some of the uh, expenditure reductions, uh, the budget reductions. This year, if you look at the 20, the last part of the grade to the right, the 2012-13 uh, represents this year. There's a slight uptick this year, and uh, the budget was actually um, lower this year slightly than the previous year, but some expenditures that were planned for next year are actually uh, brought into this year, a couple of expenditures, so that is bringing it up slightly, but um, that's essentially what the expenditures look like over the past few years. The, the, the two f data points out in the future show um, I'm going to say roughly flat. It goes up and down a little bit, but it's been, it's bouncing around the, um, the you know the 20 uh, 2 million 2.8 million uh, plus or minus. And if you look at the arrows, um, kind of projecting out, I I view uh, we've got a couple of years of expenditures that we're putting into the infrastructure, which I will go over in detail in the in the presentation. So I I believe that going forward, if we want to sort of maintain with some slight. Uh, transformational work in the district, uh, we will be hovering around that level. Um, but then again, if there's other priorities in the district that require other investments, then those, um, you know, that, tra that tra trajectory could change. Uh, to the right on the target expenditure level, I, I um, took, a, took a stab at trying to draw a line at, at where I felt um, would be a, a good level to, to be holding um, going forward in order to maintain uh, not only what we have in place to be able to replace some of the equipment as it ages, but also to provide some transformational uh, technology to be able to move the district forward. If you look at the lower uh, half of the view graph, that shows the expenditures in terms of percentages of the blue representing pure maintenance. Uh, we, ha we really have to pay that. That's warranty payments. That's uh, um, uh, uh, contracts that we are bound by to pay for services and things like that. We just, that money is absolutely required. The red uh, section represents in investments in replacing re uh, aging equipment. It also represents some investments in some new equipment that wouldn't necessarily be considered transformational, but it's, it's uh, helping us, uh, helping us uh, move forward as a district. For example, um, I'll give you an example of maybe a higher capacity switch or router isn't transformational, but it is helping the district increase capacity and move forward. So that would land in, in that red band. And then the green band at the top represents the percentage of the budget that we've spent in the past uh, and and also that we're projecting to spend in the, in the, in the next, next couple of years on transformational technologies such as class, new classroom technologies or other technologies that really help the district move forward quickly. For example, uh, virtual desktop infrastructure technology, things that are coming, coming on um, that enable, um, that really improve the environment and enable the district to move forward in a much, uh, in a different rate than in the past. So that's, those are targets uh, that I've, that I've, established based on past spending and trying to show where we are basically with the maintenance, with the um, enhancement, the, the blue and the red, but also leaving some room for transformational um, spending. And of course, as a board and as an administration, we can discuss the, the mix of percentages, but those are, I thought I would put those out there as a, as a, um, as a recommendation or at least a baseline to start to, to, to work with going forward. Um, the next slide shows, I want to show some trends that have gone on in the last several years within District 205 to give you a, a high-level picture of um, how, we, how we've moved with respect to um, the infrastructure but also some of the classroom technology. The, the, the top slide, the top right, I'm sorry, the top left represents the, the number of systems that we, that we support in the district. The, the district technology team is either running locally on our servers or they're hosted, but it involves data transfer, data exports, transfers, and, and uploads to other systems, a lot of data manipulation, um, pumping data up to the state of Illinois, um, just moving data within our systems within the district in order to do um, assessments and other things like that. And you can see that we've, we've really grown rapidly. I don't show this year's numbers on there, but I, I, I'm going to guess they're, they're about that number. They might have been a slight uptick this year, but it really has sort of flattened out a little bit. But we're at a very high level, and uh, those systems are supported by the same people that we've had back in 2006 7 So there's been no increase in staff at all in, in, those, uh, in that area. And then the, the two slides below that, or the two graphs below that, show a trend of growth of the computers in the district, and as well as other technologies in the classroom, the, I, the iPads, iPods, and also the interactive whiteboards, as well as some of the Chromebooks that we've introduced recently. Um, 
it doesn't show, but I would want, want to mention that in the, I'd say in the last three to four years, every single classroom in Elmhurst 205 has gone from not having a, a mounted projector or an Elmo to having both of those, every single classroom. So when you talk about uh, the support of those devices, that involves um, hands-on. When we have issues with those devices, it's, it's a hands-on thing. We have to go to the class. We have to pick the thing up. We have to bring it back, repair it, or deliver it. So, so even adding those devices, even though they're relatively low maintenance, when there is an issue, it involves you know, it's very hands-on. So um, quite a bit of technology added over the years. I will, I will comment, though, that the funding that you saw, the, the budgets you saw in the prior view graph is what enabled that to happen. <laughs> and that was the support of the community and the board of, uh, of allowing the district to grow the technology in this way. So that's the, that's the outcome. Um, the, this slide represents um, the compensation that the, that the district has invested in purely just the technology support, just the end user support. And, um, and that, that's basically it, AV media and, and end user support. It's just a portion of the technology department. Um, the, the up and down of the graph is because we uh, had some overlapping periods where we insourced that staff. It used to be all outsourced and contracted, and now it's all insourced and Elmhurst employees. And in that path, we've had some overlapping periods where we've had to have um, overlap of staff and some cross-training going on. But essentially, you can see by FY12, through um, bringing this, the um, service in-house and by reducing by one, uh, one FTE in FY12 that we, we hit the low point of uh, $522,000 of total compensation that includes salary and benefits. And then there was an uptick this year because of some positions that opened and we tried to hire in with higher, uh, some higher skilled staff to help help our strength, but still the same number of headcount. And so we're up to about 544,000 now. And I'm anticipating that that's going to be relatively level. Because at this point, we have the team in place. We're done with the transition. We've done an FTE reduction in FY12. And what you're going to see going forward is your standard um, percentage increases that, that, that the district uh, salary increases uh, and benefit increases uh, uh, you know, contribute to that. So you're not going to see the up and down as much anymore unless we do staffing level changes. With that, um, you see the growth in computers and the relatively level staffing. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, ticket activity. And you can see that the turnaround time of the tickets is um, taking a little bit longer to get to. So that's. Uh, you know, potentially there's a cause and effect there, um, but uh, there's certainly some trends going on where we have more more issues. You would expect more issues with that much more technology in the district and the same number of people. Um, and then our customer satisfaction rating, we were very, very proud of um, moving with all the changes and additions and uh, staff transitions and everything that we had over the years, and we were still managed to increase four surveys in a row, or actually from the baseline, then three surveys after the baseline we increased, and then all of a sudden we are now um, seeing some significant drops, and that's a that's a big that's a big concern for us. Um, we're not uh, in a, st a state of uh, you know disarray and, and, and confusion and disappointment. We're, we're looking at this as a challenge. We've set the goal for ourselves of a four and a half um, minimum level of customer satisfaction, overall customer satisfaction from our team. So we know we have a lot of work to do. We've got to turn this trend around, and we have to gain that ground back again. And we're working on uh, process improvements, tool improvements. It does. There are some investments going on uh, to um, provide some server, uh, some imaging server technology, and some things like that that we can turn equipment around more quickly, more cleanly, with you know fewer um, human error types of things that we can introduce. Sort of more automated imaging processes. And we're trying to um, just get better at what we do, and also uh, work on our customer um, relations and work on our professionalism and try to make sure that we're, we're really treating our, our end users, our customers, as best as we, as best as we can. So our, our goal is to turn that around and march that back up to four and a half. Um, so then that's sort of a look at the, at the, the dollars but, and also the, um, some of the trends that have occurred. And now some of the, uh, the next couple of slides summarize some of the findings that um, the various groups that I've interfaced with over the last couple of years to develop the, the district technology plan. Some of the key findings in those discussions are just summarized in the next couple of slides here. And one is uh, a feeling that increased student access to devices is needed. And um, it really supports, um, it's going along with the trends. You'll see the national technology, the national educational technology plan and other leading documents uh, and plans point towards much more collaboration, online collaboration, uh, always on learning, 
um, being able to um, communicate in different ways and have also technology-based interventions. So the trend is to have much increased access to devices. Also, the, uh, the assessments are going online as well. I think that's mentioned up there, but the, like the park assessments, for example, are, will be required to be online in the 2014-15 school year. And so we're going to have, um, we're going to need to look at the device situation within Elmhurst 205 and figure out how we're going to um, how we're going to tackle that uh, digital with that comes digital curriculum development and um, which needs to be planned and, and budgeted to be able to to make that happen um, leadership training so that um, all um, you know the expectations first of all there's an understanding of where we're headed but there's you know expectations um, that everyone's on the same page and that this all towards uh, there's research that proves like uh, the, the leadership understanding and buy-in of of advancing um, through increased access to technology and the increased use of it within um, instruction helps do, helps improve student achievement. In other words, if you don't have the principal leadership or the, or the leadership buy-in and training on that, then your, your results are not as likely to succeed. That's another way of putting that, that bullet. Other drivers are the teachers themselves here in District 205 in, in focus groups have requested more opportunities for professional development and instructional technology support at the building level. And that's um, part of behind, uh, the discretionary, the recommendation on the discretionary staffing list where we had a 4.0 FTE called out as, as a recommendation. Um, so that's really in uh, knowing where we're headed in the future, but also in partly in response to feedback that we've received. And when you, we meet with other districts, we're finding that that's really the standard in, in most districts really all districts have some some level of support for instructional technology in the buildings or if it's, it might be shared resources but there's some dedicated resources that are in the district then the next point the district infrastructure will go into that uh, quite a bit more in the next few slides but that's that's a, a key thing that we need to have in place and then again my technology staff my my department needs to continue to incorporate improvements and processes and tools we have to try to do better with what we have because that's a, that's the situation that we're in Oh. Yes. Our, that goes back to your last slide, right? So because you're saying you're increasing the the equipment and devices. Oh, you're you're um. Oops, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um. So that goes back to your last slide, and you've increased, you know, all the devices and technology, um, you know, computers, <coughs> uh, not just in the infrastructure, but even in the classroom with the um, whiteboards, um, iPads, all those things, and then you've. You've tried to reduce or main tried to reduce the the expense for your total compensation, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you you're seeing that there's um, that that you are looking at more tickets being opened. You're looking at maybe higher turnaround time because it's more complex now, and potent your customer satisfaction going down. So what you're doing is looking at that continuous improvement process and this process and tools for improvement to say why is that. Am I drawing those connections? Are those data points that, linked? That's absolutely right. One, yeah. one of the things uh, we've done every year, the, the survey results we have are from an annual survey. It's the same survey that we've issued every year. We try to keep it consistent so we can compare the data. And there's several questions in that survey, and, but there's also comments. And we, we look at the comments. We look at the, the results, but the, 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 the numerical results. But I think what's even more revealing are the comments. And we've looked at trends in the comments as well. We've gone from the two years ago, two-thirds of our comments were positive, one-third were constructive, and now we've been inverse. We've got one-third constructive, two-thirds, uh, I'm sorry, one-third positive, two-thirds constructive. So, and we've also looked at the themes within those comments to pull out what are the themes? What, what do we see in there that's, that, what is it telling us? What, and, and we're finding things into that we, we know we need to work on. One of the things, honestly, is I, I think, I, I don't know, I, I'm not a psychologist or anything, but, you know, <laughs> You know, I think people are running hot, and it gets, they get stressed out. And I think I think our own um, interactions with some of the staff might need to be revisited and, and work on, you know, how we respond to issues when, when we're under pressure. But, but I do think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, com comments about, you know, we don't we don't see your we're not able we don't see staff in our building support staff in our building often enough or things like that. And I think it just it has to do with the workload. And I think we're I'm not. You know, I'm not suggesting a staff increase at this point in time. I'm just pointing out that I think that's the reality. I think that's what those trends are showing. And we need to look at what we can do, what's within our control. My team is looking at what's within our control. Our, but what's within our control are the, the processes, the tools, and looking at the feedback we have and trying to figure out how we can do better. And the Harris poll results, there's some information in there, but that, that had to... That, was, that tended to be more about 
um, parent and student satisfaction with the technology in the building. So they might talk about how much access they have to technology or whether the teacher is um, skilled at using technology and things like that. There wasn't a lot of direct feedback to my team that will help us in terms of how we do our jobs, but the internal survey that we do every year has given us a lot of information to work with. And then I guess the only other point that I was thinking of is we've added more, thanks to the PTAs and generous um, parents and community members to bring more devices in or technology um, application to education in the classrooms for instruction, but that does that mean that we have our own employees, or is it a combination of that and contract employees that go out to these sites if there's an issue? It's our own. All, yeah, we're fully Elmhurst 205 employees. We used to have contract employees here, but not any, not any longer. Not for not in the technology department. So. Okay, um, I'm going to step through some changes in our network infrastructure. I'm going to try not to, um, hopefully I don't, uh, I, I don't want to get too technical here. I just wanted to, to point out some key, key changes that are either happening or will happen. And the whole purpose of this is to open up some bottlenecks that are going to enable some, some bandwidth and some data to flow. Because fundamentally, if we don't have the, uh, the network and the connections engineered, effectively, you know, engineered appropriately, then I think we're going to be um, not able to really move forward with some of the some of the things that are coming in the future. So I'm just going to step through this. Now, this is not the, the animation. There's some animation here, but it's not going to be anything like Charles uh, Sprandell's animation. I'm just tell, telling you, I, I can't compete with Charles. Um, so the, the, the graph here, the, the chart here represents the top, the top square uh, kind of rounded corner box up there is, represents York. That's where the data center is. And then uh, the, below the, um, this, the bottom third of that graph, there's two sort of other boxes down there. Those represent closets within each building. So there's a main closet on the left side that's connected to the wide area network that's actually part of AT&T's network. We have a fiber network, and that um, comes into each building in a closet. But most buildings have additional closets around the buildings that have uh, other switches that, that connect all, basically where all the computers and all the uh, access points are all connected. Um, through those edge switches. So that's kind of the layout of the graph. You can see on the, on the, on the right there's the AT&T, the internet cloud, and on the left is the wide area network. So we, we, we subscribe to uh, AT&T services for both of those uh, networks. Um, actually, last summer we started this. The core network and the, wire, and the wireless uh, controllers at York were upgraded last summer. It was a major expenditure. Um, but necessary because those components were put into the building when York was renovated like 10 or 11 years ago, and so it was time. And also they did not have the capabilities or the capacity that were needed for the district. So that was done last summer. Um, if, keep your eye on that. Um, okay, here we go. This is phase two. This is what we're planning to do this fiscal year. The box that has that little firewall in it, we, over spring break, we upgraded the firewall. It's much bigger now, just like that. <laughs> and um, the fire, it's a new firewall. And the reason we needed to do that was because the, the existing technology, the one that we had before spring break, was just not capable of handling any more than 100 megabits of internet traffic. We could not have taken any more data from the internet without a new piece of equipment. So we upgraded that over spring break. And now, once we, uh, this summer rolls around and we, and we upgrade our internet bandwidth, we'll have 500 megabits. Now that's a yellow line. Yellow, you know, green is good, red is not so good, Ye or re red is bad, and actually yellow is kind of in between. The reason I left that, that internet link as yellow instead of green is because I think 500 megabits will serve us well for, for a while, a couple years, two, three maybe. We have to keep our eye on that because it may come to the point where we find that we actually have to do a... Um, an increase in bandwidth. I'm, I don't think 500 megabits is going to do us f for a long time. The park uh, tech requirements would actually, um, the, the targets that park is, is published would put that, wouldn't, it's not adequate for the, a district our size, but I think what we need to do is get started and monitor the bandwidth and then potentially do an increase down the line. But I, I didn't want to oversubscribe now. I'm, right now we're at 100 megabits, 500 megabits is five times. I think we should grow into that and then determine when we need, to, when we need more. And then um, if you keep your eye on the <laughs> lower left corner, I use my high technology pointer here. The, uh, down here, the, the, um, the routers in the, uh, all the main network closets around the district, you'll see, I, I will bring to, 
I will bring to the board later in April a recommendation that's going to include some of this equipment. Actually, yeah, anything that from now in, on this view graph I'm talking about was going to be in a recommendation that comes later this month. These are main closet um, router upgrades, absolutely necessary in order to take advantage of the WAN upgrade that we subscribe to. So once we have the WAN upgrade, we're going to have 10 gigabits. So that's, that's more than 10 times the bandwidth that we'll be able to process at York for the entire district. And between all the buildings, we will have one gigabit of WAN. So that is 20 times our current capacity. And I'll, the, I'll get to a view graph that will explain why this, what this is all going to enable us for. So that's coming. Also, there's some access points um, that we're going to need to upgrade our wireless network. You'll see that the, the, red, the red arrows here indicate that we are limited at 54 megabits per connection. But when we upgrade, we'll have nine, what, eight, nine times that, whatever that math comes out to. And, um, but you'll see that there's still red lines there. Um, even after all that work, you've got um, connections from the access points and from the computers back to the edge switches that are still bottlenecking. When, if you have a lot of activity going on, you're still potentially not able to take, you're not able to take full advantage of that 450 megabit access point because you only have 100 megabits coming back to the switch. So what does that mean? Next year, in next summer of 2014, I'm going to be coming back and saying we need to um, we need to invest in the edge switches, which, I, which would, would be upgraded. These edge switches would be upgraded. And that you can see now that all the connections from all the way from the end users all the way back to the network are all green at this point. And what that, you've got basically data flowing at reasonable rates all through the network. There still might be some access points that we need to replace in a, in a later phase, so we would put, bring those in as well. So my view is that budget permitting, in two years, um, we can be um, end to end upgraded all the bottlenecks within the district that will enable the, the capacity that, that we need. So what, what will that do? What does that mean? Well, basically, the new equipment that we put in will be the latest um, Cisco technology. It will have more capabilities and more capacity. It will have more years of, it will have, we'll have all that, there will be new equipment, we'll have all those years of service ahead of us that we can, we can, um, we can, we can rely on. So we're getting rid of some pretty old equipment and we're going to be run, riding on some new equipment for many years to come. It provides significantly more bandwidth throughout the district, end to end, by the time we're done. Um, this will enable a lot of things. Without this, we really have to basically put the brakes on and not go too far. But with these investments, we'll have cloud-based learning and collaboration. We can, we can rely on a lot of activities on the internet. Now, we're, now we have to be very careful because we have a limited link. Um, higher device concentrations due to the wireless upgrades. We can have devices in classrooms in, in large quantities. Um, and I, I, can sp daily, I think um, even uh, you know, even uh, at recently in some of our schools, I've got reports of, of, of devices dropping off a network, and that's because we have wireless issues. Um, the online testing will be, um, it, it, we'll, we'll basically be meeting the park requirements for now. Um, we'll, so that, that sets us up for the online park uh, testing that starts. Again, we're going to have to monitor our internet, internet connection to make sure that we're not um, underdoing it down the line. And then other things such as cloud-based services, um, we could start to look at email, file backups, disaster recovery, other things like that over, the, over our network connections in the cloud. And then other services can run on our network, like the IP video surveillance, for example. Right now, we would not want to put any more than one or two at the most, you know, cameras in any remote buildings that would that would um, send traffic back to York High School because the, the network connections would not be able to handle it. But with the upgrades, we could start we could expand out as needed in some other buildings, for example, and do do video surveillance traffic on the network, or we could do remote desktop v, VDI technology over the network as well. So the, the net, it's just a very enabling investment at that, uh, which which I really think in, in we, we really need to face. Um, let me just summarize what this means in terms of dollars here. I won't go through every line item, but you can see um, every year we, we try to reserve some money for instructional technology for classrooms, teachers, and students. And last year, or this current fiscal year, that, that was invested into some one-to-one uh, -one pilot technology at York High School, some of the, uh, the initial Novas at the middle schools, and some smart boards for grade one. So that's the type of investment that that money goes toward and working with the curriculum department and other instructional leaders that's we figure out together wh where's the best spend for that to support the curriculum and and um other pilot sort of, sorts of activities in the district then um you'll see standard every year a round of computer replacements 
You'll see that the infrastructure investments this year, we're looking at the, um, some expansion of our virtual desktop infrastructure to be able to get to more labs with the, um, with the uh, thin client devices. The, uh, network infrastructure I went over already. Some uninterruptible power supplies in the York closets. Those things, are, those things were put in when York was renovated, so they're 10 and 11 years old. They need to be replaced. Um, server virtualization, we're looking to virtualize more servers. Um, this enables us to um, stop having one box per basically per server function, and we can run multiple servers on, on a given single physical server. Um, expanding IP video surveillance, um, and then you can see the rest are you know, things that, we're, that we're, we're basically committed to, the existing lease payments, the, our WAN and internet service, and then we just we basically have some miscellaneous um, ex expenses that we, we have to incur to just kind of keep things uh, moving forward. And then the, the bottom, the maintenance section is, um, really, again, um, committed to warranties, um, contracts, and things like that. So that, that's, that's a rundown of how it looks for next year. It's a 2.6, almost $2.7 million target um, for fiscal 2013-14. And just a comment, these numbers and, and the, the, the borrowing and things that are behind these numbers are all part of the PMA projections. And um, Mr. Um, Welton's been involved, and in, I've been working with Mr. Welton on all these numbers for months, and we've had many turns on this. And so it's all fairly well understood by the finance department. And I think I took an early version of this to the, the finance subcommittee, and I could always come back to the finance subcommittee if necessary. But so these numbers have been uh, have been kind of uh, maturing for a while, and they are uh, converging down. To, it'll, it would look like something like this if the budget were approved. Um, these would be the numbers in that budget for technology for next year. Yes, these aren't approved. These are just preliminary. Um, numbers that I would be putting in as a requisition basically for next year and of course then it goes through the budget approval process. So all these, all this, all this, these things would be um, re part of the larger budget approval process. And then looking ahead, um, these, this is really estimations based on you know, ex past experience but also um, it's assumed, make, there's a lot of assumptions in, in this but essentially it's about a three million dollar bogey and again that's because we have, we, we're building up our lease payments a little bit and also we're adding an additional um, we're, we're continuing to build out the infrastructure, that, that other phase. I was talking the second phase where we need to finish that infrastructure build out plus the virtual desktop infrastructure. If we decide to continue with that technology, if it's successful, then there will have to be some more investment made there, but that, that's to be determined. So I think we need to evaluate the VDI and then make decisions about whether that, that's something we want to continue to expand or we want to cap it where we have it. But right now, if I were, you know, it, that, that's a number that I would assume at this point. Um, okay, so just some other points. All those things we've talked about so far are, I would like call a plan of record, but other things that I think we need to keep in mind and um, discuss as a team. Again, I brought, I'm going to bring up the building-based uh, building instructional technology support. I think it's something that we need to look at if we can, um, as we talk going forward in the future, if we can f uh, find ways to start to introduce some of that support, that would be great. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but I, I would like to continue to have that conversation um, with Mr. Johns, Dr. Johns, and also the administration and the board. Um, and then, again, the professional development for curricular technology in this initiative is it always comes up as a high runner when you talk to staff and when you, when you read the research. That's always something that's um, cited as critical. And then process improvements, um, looking at you know, curriculum development that, that uh, and, and I think that's going to be incorporated into what um, Dr. John's team is working on anyway. He, we've had some conversations recently, so that's sort of, um, unless there's something special we need to do, I'm, I think a lot of that work will be done as part of the, of the normal curricular development cycle. Um, but there's some big work to do on logistics supporting the online testing. We have some problems to solve there, so we're going to have to uh, probably pull some, some folks together and try to look at our options and look at what ways we can move forward to support this, the park testing. Uh, we need to, with some of these changes, we need to look at our policies and procedures and make sure that they're, they're up to date um, and um, in line with current trends. And then also, another area that I think we need to look at is, I'll call it digital workflows, but it's how, do we, how will students and teachers collaborate, communicate, and, and, and transfer this work, this digital work, uh, amongst each other. So there are some systems out there that enable some of those things to happen, and we don't have anything like that right now in Elmhurst, so I think we need to evaluate um, how once we are as we move more digital, how are we going to um, have this information, um, you know, developed and submitted in for grading, returned back to students, things like that, but also just like I said, communication, collaboration, things like that. Okay, so then uh, other other items are um, 
that just a recognition that there's an increased demand for devices and, and a lot, some of it has to do with assessment in the future, but some of it is just pure, I hear it all the time, you know, we're trying to get into labs and, and there's just a um, desire to have it more access. Um, classroom management system, that's alluding to a little bit about um, not so much classroom management in the traditional sense of student behavior, but more having to do with um, having teachers able to have um, environments like um, collaborative environments. It's actually sort of related to the digital workflows um, point. And then data analysis reporting tools. I, again, that's something that right now is we're very spreadsheet, spreadsheet driven and, and I think Dr. John's team is looking at developing a, a database to help with some of that. But um, as we move forward, we just have to keep our eye on you know, what tools uh, do we need to support ourselves for the data analysis and, and getting the information to teachers um, to help them make informed decisions. And then, again, just cloud-based services, continuing to look at how can we evolve what we do here, how can we put more into the cloud and um, take some of the burden off of the local IT staff and also just the, the local expense. And I think that's a trend you, you hear about when you, if you read the, um, read publications, read articles about cloud computing, that's t typically cited as one of the benefits is, is the um, shifting of the cost and the effort of IT to the cloud. But, um, you know, I, I, would, I wouldn't say, you know, we're, we're focused on that at, like a business might be, but we certainly want to, we certainly want to, um, what I mean by that is it's not like we're profit, we're, we're not a profit center where we're, uh, just, that's our total focus. I mean, we're here to if we're here to st educate students, but we're also trying to be as cost effective as possible. And so, where we can move things off, for example, office productivity, if we can get that into the cloud, then that's going to save some some effort at, uh, and some support costs. So, I'm always trying to find ways to do that. The um, I think we just need to keep our eye on that and try to push more and more out if we can. But of course, our infrastructure is what enables that. So. Um, that is the presentation, and I would be happy to take questions or answer comments, questions. Mrs. Steuven. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you, David, for this. I, it was very helpful. Um, I know that over the past several years, you've really been um, conscious of not spending as much and even cutting technology investment because of the financial um, situation. So I, I think that's good. Um, I like the fact that you're looking at, you know, the vision of what we have to accomplish because at some point, you know, you, you, you have to reinvest. And I know when you first came on board, um, you know, there was a big investment. And, and we don't want to get to the point where, you know, we, we're not investing properly to maintain um, our, our technology, especially as you look at it from both the foundational technology and then the application of the technology to our education instruction. So I thought that was really good the way that you laid it out that way and that that's how kind of you're planning on um, presenting it to us and working um, with the district. So I wanted to com commend you for that. Um, and that's really, you know, what I had because I've asked my questions and I see where you're headed and I know that you're talking more detail with the Finance and Operations Committee. Um, so thank you. Anything else? Mr. Smith, thank you very much. Very, oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Bloom has a question. Yeah, you know, th thank you. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. And um, you know, really concisely laid out kind of what we're talking about. But I, I think what I wanted to point out is, is that we're, we're talking about as a foundational investment. Um, you know, what this does is it gives us the capability to take advantage of new ways for kids to learn, um, new ways for people to collaborate, new ways for staff to develop. Um, it fac you know, it, it'll facilitate all of that. We don't know which way any of those directions are going to take in the future, but if we don't have this, you don't have the option to even explore that. And I think to, to achieve a return on this investment in our district, because it's a significant amount of money, you know, we do have to make sure that in everything we do, when we're talking about curriculum, when we talk about staffing and things like that, that we ask ourselves, how do we take advantage of the opportunity that's you know, provided by the investment that we're making in the infrastructure to do things online, to collaborate better, differently, more efficiently, to deliver content you know, maybe differently. Um, and, and so I think that's the challenge. This is a multi-year evolution. You're giving us the tools, but I think we have to use them in order to generate that return. So I think we need, as a board, need to keep an eye on how, how we're gaining return from this investment and hold ourselves accountable for this over time.
Mr. McDonough. What is it that you would like us to bring to the community out of this presentation? If you could give us a few points of public communication that would support you because, again, I, I should start out by saying thank you. I think it's wonderful. I told you in the hall, and I, I really think it's great. It's a great thing. And now I, I feel like, you know, we need to support you in our own public communications. Wow, okay. Um, that's, well, one, one thought that pops to mind is some of the work that we have to do takes time and an investment as, you know, I laid out a two-year plan, and a lot of that work was infrastructure work. Um, I feel that really has to be done. It's necessary, and it will take time and effort. And I think sometimes there's um, it's a desire to move faster than, you know, to run before we can walk. And, and, and I know a lot of other districts, people may hear things from other districts about how quickly they're moving, and there's different variables and, you know, different fact patterns, I think, in, in, around in different districts. And I think in, El, in Elmhurst, um, you know, we, we, we do try to th discuss things through, think things through, and move in a measured way. And um, it will take time to, to, to move along. You may not see a, a, a device in every student's hand in two years. That's, that's really fast. It requires a lot of work on the infrastructure, but it requires probably even more work on helping teachers and, and talking about what does that mean with respect to um, what goes on in a classroom. So I think that's one of the messages is, is we, we want to move forward in a, um, in a measured way where we understand what's going on and we've engaged all the appropriate people. Um, so I do think we need to continue to invest to move forward, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I personally feel that, that we shouldn't just start throwing um, money and, and devices or, and things all over the place without, some, without working it out in terms of well, how's it going to be used, how's it going to be... How's it going to help students? I, th I think those conversations need to be held. And I know we 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 have the curricular technology committee, which which meets periodically. It meets three times a year, maybe four. Um, it's not often enough, but then we also don't like pulling teachers out of the classroom too much either. But we're, we try to have conversations with that group. It's a district-wide group uh, re representing all buildings and, and all grade levels, and also we we try to to tap into those folks to get guidance from them as to what, how do they feel as, as the representatives of their peers across the district. So we try to engage and, and talk through these things. So, and that's one message I would give. Um, but I, I would also ask that, you know, um, I, I think, and back on the, on the budget uh, graph, the very first view graph, which I could go back, but I have to click through all that wonderful animation. But um, the, the line that was drawn for the target levels, um, I, I, I really believe that we need to tr try to stay at or, or above those lines because if you, I think if you drop below those for any period of time, we did dip below briefly, but we kind of pulled ourselves back up. But I think if you drop too low, you're, you're, you're not only s stopping potentially, you're actually maybe degenerating at some point. So I think we need to keep a certain level in place. I tried to, I tried to calculate a level that I felt was um, reasonable and conservative and not, you know, not pouring on the coals too much. So that, that also, though, that also governs how quickly you can move as well. So there's, there's cultural reasons why we don't move, maybe aren't moving as fast as others, but there's also, I think, you know, in, uh, other reasons, financial reasons, so hope that helps. Mrs. Hirsch. When I think about where we were as a district in terms of technology five or six years ago, I, I, the, the changes have been beyond remarkable. We have a professional, sophisticated, reliable set of systems that are in place to support instruction. And I agree with you, Mr. Bloom, that we need to make sure that we're focusing on getting the bang for the buck in terms of actually having it be transformative in terms of the actual instructional process. But I think if you can try to imagine, if we think of where we were five years ago and try to imagine where we're going to be five years from now in education, I think it's going to be dramatically different. So I think this is a very measured approach. I think we're focusing on the infrastructure to ensure that we're going to have the bandwidth and the pipes in place to be able to handle whatever curricular pieces and instructional pieces we want to lay on top of this. I think our plan is a very solid plan. And uh, it'll be very exciting to see where we end up in five years. But I think, um, you know, a lot of dedication on Dave's part, on Dave's team's part, on our building's part. I think the other thing you have to think about is how comfortable each individual teacher and staff person is with technology as compared to where they were five years ago. Their comfort level 
their expectations, I think, are probably also increasing in terms of what we're going to be able to do for them. Um, and think about kids. Five years ago, kids weren't walking around with iPhones. Now they're three years old walking around with iPhones, their parents' iPhones entertaining them for a while. So I think the focus on the, on the infrastructure is the right thing to do. And congratulations on making it this far. Anything else for Mr. Smith? Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Pernot? Yeah, I just want to update the board on uh, the development. We, you gave us a task, the administrative team, to start looking at a restructuring plan for the school district. And I just thought I'd give you an up -to -date, uh, update on where we are. We have been, uh, the assistant superintendents and I have been meeting probably once a week since we got that task with the Board of Education. Uh, what we're finding is just to come up with what a projection might look like five years out from now is a very complicated process because there's so many moving parts to trying to predict uh, what funding is going to look like over the next five years. But we need that database and that understanding before we go back and then say, okay, what is the consequence for Elmhurst School District? I think the technology piece that you just saw is a good example of that. Uh, Dave has a projection for two years. We're trying to look at five years. What is it we're going to need over a five-year period in the whole area of technology, including support staff, including new technology? technology, including how does that affect our curriculum. Uh, th there are other wild parts, the pension. Uh, th there is still no definitive answer on where the pensions are going to go. So again, we're kind of in the dark. But we are going to be presenting to the board what we think is probably um, the right size uh, funding model that we think is probably a conservative model, but in, given this day and age and the economy uh, not seeming to turn around as fast as people would hope, I think you're going to see us with a very conservative uh, prediction on where that funding is going to be. That is going to affect how much additive programs or how many programs we will be starting to look at for restructuring over the next five years. Uh, and, and right now, um, one of the things I think we are looking at as a team is, are there things we can do structurally that would, res that would result in savings over the next 10 years? Uh, but those are dramatic pieces. When you look at restructuring over a long period of time, you are looking at sometimes a very different school district than what you have right now. So we want to be careful. We want to be thorough. We want to make sure that we have, uh, when we start discussing this, that we have as much background and information for the board as we can possibly get on what those choices are, what that restructuring may look like, and how we move forward from that. So uh, it's not, I want to make sure the board, it's not forgotten. We're continuing to look at it. Uh, and I would imagine by the end of the year, beginning of the fall, we will start reporting back to the board on what that may look like, uh, what the restructuring options are, and, and hopefully uh, we'll have more from the state about what our funding options are going to be and you know what's going to happen with pension what's going to happen with transportation reimbursement what's going to happen with the federal dollars that are sequestered right now all of those are things that affect uh, looking out over a five to six year period as to what a sustainable model for this district is going to look like so I don't know if the board has any questions about that I know it's a brief summary but I just want to make sure that the board knew uh, that we were still engaged in that discussion as an administrative team. Mrs. Gironi? I think that's a great exercise. I think it's a great activity. Exercise makes it sound like it's not going to get used, and I don't think that's going to happen. But what I would hope is that you, while you look for a sustainable model within that model, that you are still envisioning growth. And, and the Lighthouse School District where we want to be and, and giving the board some options as to how to get there with the funds that you think we're going to have. And that is the trick. I, I know that's the trick. But, you know, just, I just don't, I don't want you spending your time just sustaining you know what I mean? I mean, we can't even we can't even maintain with with the funds that are coming in right now. So we got to make changes just to do that. But I I hope that you'll be looking at spending resources in such a way that we don't just maintain, but that we grow. 
and, and we, increase student achievement. We are. It's a, it's a reallocation. Exactly. Again, of how we operate on some of the basic assumptions on how you operate a school district. And it's a zero-sum game, as you know, because you're not going to get added dollars to do innovation in the near future. So if you want to do innovation, if you want to do those kinds of things that keep us on the cutting edge of Lighthouse District, you're going to have to really look at, I think, a very, very different structure of the school system. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What is that structure Good. going to look like? Uh, what are the pros and cons of doing that kind of structuring? Um, and what does that gain us and for how long and what are the advantages versus the disadvantages because the other thing we hear and I haven't in the, been in the community that long but I know for sure people love the district as it is they like it um, they like what we offer they like it exactly the way it is but I think there's we're gonna have to challenge ourselves to say well is there a model that's different but maybe better in the long term or maybe better in the short term but may look somewhat different than what Elmhurst has looked like in the past and that'll be the challenge for the community for all of us to have that discussion um, you know and and, and hopefully it's a great community discussion and problem-solving discussion about what we do with Elmhurst as a school district to get us to a lighthouse district but with the challenge of Funding as it is, basically, of what we have right now is probably as good as it's going to get for the near future. Yeah, funding as it is or unknown. <laughs> or unknown. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the unfortunate thing. It, 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 if there was one thing I would hope uh, legislators, you know, not only in Illinois, but in other states I've seen, is if they could just predict and give school districts predictable funding over a longer period of time. This year-to-year -year change in funding makes it impossible to do long-term strategic planning. It, it, not that it's impossible, but it's very, very difficult. Even if we're going to know over the next three years are going to take X percentage reductions, and it's coming, it gives you time to plan, it gives you time to have discussion, it gives you time to work, to work through those. But when you go from a year-to-year -year basis, almost a month-to-month -month basis on what the funding is going to look like, it makes it very difficult to do that kind of planning. So. You know, one of the things I think that we, when we engage legislators, is to say, is there any way to get more predictable funding to schools, whatever that funding is, let us know up front so that we can be responsible and plan for that, rather than this up and down kind of model that we have right now. That's kind of, you never know what's behind the curtain until August, and then it's pulled back, and there you have it. Mr. Bloom? Yeah. And, and thank you. And uh, acknowledging the growth and the, the innovation aspect. I mean, this isn't a conversation that I think any of us really want to have. Um, you know, it, it's easier to have things just keep going the way they are if they could, but they can't. And, um, you know, this is a multi year process. And I think I just want to make sure that when we're doing this, it's not strictly numbers driven. Um, because I think when we talk to the community, the, you know, the reality of having to make cuts is painful, but. To be able to offer, you know, a carrot to go with that that says, but education has changed over time. We're looking at the things we do. We think that we can drive better outcomes. We think we can enhance, you know, professional staff development, things like that, that we know that we need to do to be a great district. And so there's there's kind of a balance between the pain and the gain um, into what we put together. And, and, you know, and I think this is something that the private sector has been going through for years. I mean, I think that... You know, I know I've had many conversations with my CEOs that says, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to grow next year, and I can't give you any more money to do it. Um, you know, you're from Michigan. I mean, thank goodness we're not auto suppliers where GM walks in and says, I want better quality and 5% less price, or I'm going to find another supplier next year. Um, and, and we've been living under that in the private sector for a long time, and I think it's kind of coming to roost with the budget issues in the, in the public sector. So not a comfortable conversation, but I think we have to balance um, kind of some upside with some pain because we're all going to have to share that. But um, So I just wanted to say that. Mrs. Ebner? I realized what, what I was going to talk about is the next agenda item, so I'm going to hold. That's fine. Anyone else? Then why don't we move on to the next agenda item. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Karen has introduced this, so. All right. Go ahead. So the next agenda item is board committee reports. The first of there are two committees that have met since our last meeting. Uh, the first of which is the board improvement and policy committee. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Stufen. Thank you. Uh, first off, we we tried to approach this um, this budget 
conversation. And I wanted to try to outline the steps that were taken. The first step was to draft an outline, you know, based on um, input that we've gotten from the board. Um, and then, um, you know, and based on board conversations about this um, structural budget discussion, because that's the, the objective here. The second phase was drafting the presentation, which really just articulates, you know, the facts of, of what our current situation is. Um, so we really, we, we began the discussion with an objective. Really, you know, we're saying that we want to, you know, to Susan's point, not just sustain, but at, at the same point, we do want to try to get into something more, not just maintain, but sustain a financially healthy, but ever competitive education system for all of our students. You know, ensuring that money is well spent by achieving the best performance um, and outcomes, student outcomes. So, and I would add that we would continue to, you know, and, and with that, to continue to retain and attract movement to Elmhurst by residents and businesses, you know, due to the great education system that we can um, achieve and attain. So that's kind of, you know, the premise of, of what we're trying to make sure that the presentation has those facts. So we looked at, you know, facts, figures, trends, um, reflecting the economics, the legislative um, elements, educational climate, all those realities that we face. Um, so what, what we're doing is we weren't able to get that accomplished in the first meeting, um, so we're, we're revisiting it at the April 29th meeting. Um, and then after that, we have um, next steps of reviewing this, the draft number two um, at the April 29th meeting. We want to ensure all the committee members, you know, have provided their comments thus far, and also ensure that we've we have included in this presentation the facts that we've, we as a full board have articulated in the outline. And then, you know, we're going to share um, the draft two with, and this is not in, in particular a sequential order, but share it with the full board, share it with the administration, and try to finalize that presentation based on the facts. Um, and then we start looking at our defining a communications plan. So, you know, what's, what, you know, what's the message? What, it, what are all these facts telling us? Um, who do we need to communicate uh, with and when? And then the key piece here is there's a lot of integration that's going on, right? I see integration with as we plan for our summer retreats like we've been doing the last couple years, development of goals for next year for the board and the committee work, um, because really this is the crux, crux of our issue, right? So it should, based on these you know facts and realities that we put together in this presentation as a comprehensive view, you know, what's the board work, what's the committee work that has to be done, um, and the other piece is, you know, we're doing this uh, legislative engagement, what are the elements that as we continue to work with our legislators, we, we talked about at our last committee meeting of the whole is the next phase of our legislative presentation should be the financial numbers or, you know, this element on top of it. So I just kind of wanted to lay out what the committee's doing, what we foresee, the linkages with other things that are going on with the board, and I thought that that was beneficial. So that's the budget presentation. Secondly, we talked about the Harris um, survey poll results. Once again, I'm going to talk to you about the process that we're, we're undergoing. First off, step one was we're go doing focus groups from two elements. One is our employees and our staff, and secondly, from the parents. So that's how we're approaching it. We're coming up with questions, and we'll be doing this at April 29th, too, and we're um, the committee is providing to Shannon, who is coordinating the questions. We're getting her questions um, in the meantime so that we can kind of work this um, quicker, if you will. So what we're coming up with, two sets of questions, one of which we will utilize in these focus groups to try to uncover what the root causes are with the teacher and the staff group, and then another with the, with the parent group. What we've identified is that we'll begin with working with the DLT team, and our, our um, target date is, I think it's a May 20th DLT meeting. And then from there, we may be going off to other um, teacher and staff groups, potentially through the schools, um, and that's just a thought, just kind of get you an idea of how we're, how we're approaching this. Um, the second piece is the parent um, survey results and trying to get to the root cause of um, 
the feedback that we receive so we can put together solid plans to improve it is working with um, putting together the questions for the focus group and then going out to the, like the PTA council and then potentially some of the school PTAs to get to the parents, et cetera. So that's kind of a bigger picture um, piece. Once we get the feedback and potential root causes based on these questions and um, the dialogue in these groups, then we'll put together um, you know, what truly are those root causes based on all of that, uh, those discussions, and then what's our action plan for improvement, and then measuring our improvement to see have we made progress, and then tweaking it as we go along. So that was the Harris Poll Survey. And then lastly, we talked, and this is the last element, is a little bit about um, some miscellaneous board improvement ideas and, and looking at our officer roles and responsibilities and um, maybe outlining things so that we can kind of um, share the load, if you will. So that was our meeting. Thank you. And, and any questions? Go ahead, Mrs. No, go ahead. Mrs. Ebner, go ahead. I was just going to say any questions for oh, Mrs. Oh. Stupin, but that leads right into you. Uh, a question I had was, as we're, we're meeting with the legislators mm -hmm. at the same time of developing a budget presentation, so what material do you bring to the legislators? Is it's coming from that budget presentation when you meet with the legislators? Because you've already done a few of those meetings. Mine is coming up. <laughs> Correct. Uh, so what what we've done thus far is the board had looked at it at our committee, um, let's see, mid-year review, it was a committee meeting in the whole, is that very first um, presentation that we all looked at and that we utilized for Senator Cullerton's meeting, okay? Um, and that was board and administration input into that presentation. Based on the feedback from the committee meeting of the whole, we said the second phase of that presentation should be the financial overlay, which kind of taps into what we're doing with this budget discussion. Um, so if I, re if, if, go ahead, are you going to cover that? You, you want me to, yeah. I'm not on the agenda, but I can answer that. Or do, you, go ahead, otherwise I would. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, I, and, and I don't want to be so rigid as to force these to, to come and, and, you know. But it has to be a common together. conversation. They have, to be, they, they have to be integrated. The themes have to be similar. Yeah. I think that we're at a point where um, at the upcoming Finance and Operations Committee, there is a deck, um, a PowerPoint, that is going to be um, discussed from the number standpoint. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with the general ledger and trying to aggregate some numbers. I'm asking Chris to take a look at that and make sure I'm not crazy um, and what I've kind of come up with, but starting to put some numbers with some of the statements to, to support those statements. Um, that's running in parallel with what the Board Improvement Committee is doing. I think that no, those will integrate. The point with the legislators, though, is, is that, I mean, because of that audience, it's not going to be, you know, complete overlap, but it's basically, it, you know, it's a discussion of suburban school district finance using District 205 as an example, because, you know, their constituency base, constituency base is a lot broader than that. And I think if you look at it, I, um, you know, I won't get it. We can talk through messaging and things like that, but hopefully there's some information and some data, but it, the intent is not to ask for anything beyond quit making it worse. Um, and, and um, you know, and the fact that 90% of, 90% of the funding is, is coming from the local taxpayer already, and, you know, I'm not asking you to, even pay the bills that you owe us, just please quit making it worse. Um, it, it supported with some facts behind you know, the way they may argue, but it's just laying it out and saying, and if you do this, these are the options that we have. So it's not advocating, you know, one thing, it's explaining to these folks that, you know, you can either raise revenue, which requires a referendum, which may or may not pass. You can pass through to staff, which is a contract issue, which is a union issue, which, you know, is, is obviously not easy. Or you can cut staff and cut programs. And those are only three options that we have. Those are the only levers that we can push. So if you add pension costs, if you add mandates that are unfunded, if you add the things that you, you put on our plate, these are the only three levers that we have to play with, and only one of those is under our control. And I think that's the point that we're trying to make. Again, kind of jumping forward to the message, but uh, you know, I'd like the rest of the board to see it. Um, you know, it's it's going to be discussed as part of the the committee. It'll be posted as part of that. But so so that is a message for that audience. And then some of that 
you know, I talked to John, and some of that could be used for what you guys are doing. Some of the stuff that you guys are working on can go into that. And, and these will develop. Let's not be so rigid as saying we're going to have the deck. I mean, what it's going to be is a master of different messages that, depending on your audience, you'll be able to pull out and slot and create the message that you want. So I don't no, know if, no, if that, no, that answers question your question was, that we're working because on we that. we don't have the final. So what are the, the you answered it for me, you know, some of the key pieces that so it's a consistent they're hearing a consistent yeah. theme mm -hmm. before we have the final presentation well, and it'll needed. evolve I don't I don't foresee this ever being fine you're gonna have conversations right. there are gonna be things that well, come up but I mean um, finally as we if we talk to the community when we go out to the community you know that's yeah what I'm that, that'll about, be final. that'll be that I mean for yeah. instance one of the recent things that has come up is this uh, this whole bill in in, uh, in the legislature to cap property tax increases at zero if EAVs fall and I don't know that there's an understanding among the legislatures that that would have cost us $2 million each of the last three years, which would have required us to lay off 40 additional teachers each year. And it would be, you know, it, it would be extremely harmful to education if you were to pass that bill. And if you're for education, I don't know how you can be for that bill. And, and, and so those are, and that was an issue that had come up recently that wasn't originally in the deck, but, you know, Chris gave us some numbers. We kind of put this together and boiled this down and says, let me, you know, let's explain to you guys what you're voting on here and what it does to our budget. And, and so those things will come up over time. So I would foresee that we'd be adding additional information, you know, both in that kind of a deck, but then also as we have our conversation with the community. I, I think, um, I think as John had pointed out when I was talking to him, this is going to be a long-term discussion over time that is, and the message is going to evolve as we go. So I would encourage us not to be rigid in saying that we're going to have a final. It's going to be the current, well, I, the best current draft. The final yeah. would be when we go out to the community. I mean, yeah, no, I don't mean, I don't mean to. Like, I'm not stuck I, in a rigid I, thing. It's. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, I'm not. That's not the problem. I just want to have some consistent themes as we're meeting with our legislators. That's that's all. Yeah. I'm How about just for. quit making it worse? <laughs> Sounds good. Anything else for Mrs. Stufen? <clears throat> Hearing none. Well, let's move on to Mrs. Ebner and the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Okay, we met on April 3rd, and we discussed, which is on the agenda tonight, high school instructional materials. It's on the consent agenda, and one thing I wanted to point out is the high school has submitted their proposals has have has the same elements that, that we look for in administrative proposals, um, student achievement, employee input, opportunities, challenges, and risks, financial impact and evaluation and metrics. So we continue to see an aligned proposal system that our administrators use and now the, the high school is using for, for new proposals. And uh, the, the materials you see tonight, that they'll, you will be, we will be approving that, if, if everyone agrees, to be put on display for 30 days and there was one a proposal that was held back it's going to go back to the high school it was this this material was used in a pilot program so the um, Dr. Johns is suggesting bring this back to the high school for further review and discuss possible alternatives next agenda item was we talked about goals and plans for our committee and we had a discussion about the effectiveness of our committee and decided to continue that conversation in the summer during our annual retreat. Uh, curriculum review cycle. We looked at a document from Dr. Johns that shows all curriculum adoptions for the next five years for all grades in all core areas and the unified arts, REACH, ELL. So it was a really comprehensive picture. Uh, it was draft form, so we don't, we don't have that electronically. It was just preliminary draft form, so we'll be seeing that again. Uh, but it showed a co comprehensive view of all curriculum adoptions, which can be linked to our financial projections so we have a view of you know what materials are needed how much is this is going to cost us over the next five years for technology and it will be used you know with in conjunction with um, Chris Welton to plan funding for curriculum adoptions and the park assessments 
the last thing, it was a shorter meeting this time, we reviewed school choice procedures in the event that the state of Illinois does not receive a waiver from NCLB legislation. So that was just a preliminary discussion. Uh, there, no decision was made there. And that was it. Any questions for Mrs. Ebner? Mr. McDonough? Not to uh, talk about something real scary, but what would that apply to, that school choice? Option? Well, there's a lot of different factors that come into it. I mean, it, it, you have to get results from our ISAT testing to know what schools, you know, how each school performed, you know, their percentage. So we won't have that until, I don't know, August, September. When do you, those results come in? August, September? My interpretation yeah. of Mr. McDonough's question is, in turn, can you give him the context in which school choice is being talked about? Oh, okay, uh, right, right, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, under NCLB, after a certain number of years, if I think it's four years, if a school has not met the AYP criteria, which of course keeps going up every year, then if there are other schools within that district that have met those requirements, then children could have a choice of, of school. So it's, there's a lot of rules and regulations. Like I don't, I'm not the right person to explain how those regs, mm -hmm. but what we're going through is just what a procedure be if that ever did indeed happen. What's the status of the waiver? We, no, we have no information. It's a, there's nothing. Oh. Yeah. The of the <laughs> <laughs> I watched all the heads go. Yeah, every one of them. <laughs> So we, we just said you just said plan different scenario options without having information. It's just what if scenarios. Okay. Mrs. Hirsch. Um, there are a couple of documents that Dr. Johns has developed over the last couple of years. One is the scale document, which really kind of lays out the whole roadmap for all things instructional and everything <laughs> in the district. Um, and then there's this new document that was presented to the committee um, at our last meeting. And what I encourage um, the board to do is to really look at that document, much like we look at the technology plan in terms of a capital investment. You know, I really appreciate the fact that um, Dave gave us the hum line. You know, this is what you should expect. This is this is kind of the the level at which we expect to have to continue. And I know that I think Dr. Johns is working on trying to put together kind of what the run rate is, what the hum line is going to be in terms of investment that needs to happen um, <coughs> to keep all of our curriculum in all of our areas. And I think. You know, Mr. Bloom, I think you and I have talked in the past about there are certain things that we really should treat as capital investments. This is a capital investment. This is an ongoing investment. This is never going to end. It's not like you're going to get to some point five years from now and all curriculum adoptions are done. So, um, you know, I, I think there are a couple of really stakes in the ground that, that are really key pieces that are more sophisticated than what we've had in the past in terms of having a picture of the work that the district, the central office does. When we look at that map, it shows, um, it represents the work of an, a large number of individuals who are responsible for all their curricular areas. Um, and it's a significant amount of work. Um, so I, I encourage, whether it's working with the finance committee, but I encourage we're getting a better handle and have a higher level picture and a, a longer view into key investments that we need to make in the district. And I think as opposed to treating them like, here's a social studies K-5 adoption that's gonna cost us $300,000 or $500,000, where did that come from? I think a longer term view would be warranted and a very smart move. Anything else for Mrs. Ebner? All right, hearing none. The next on our agenda is the superintendent's consent agenda. And uh, in an effort for increased transparency, let me just quickly run through what is on items A through E. Uh, our normal monthly personnel report, uh, the approval of the K through five social studies instructional materials, which have been on display in the hallway outside of this room for about the last month. 
the next is approval to display instructional materials for new and modified courses at York High School. And those are uh, two accounting courses, an entrepreneurship course, business law, guitar, uh, introduction to athletic training, Spanish 5 AP, Chinese 1, Chinese 3 and 3H, intermediate algebra, physics, genetics, literacy skills, and a new world literature course. Uh, the next item is the approval for a foreign exchange student through the Rotary Youth Exchange Program um, from Japan. Uh, and, the, and the final item is uh, the approval of the 2012-2013 amended academic calendar, which the gist of that is that will declare, now that we know how many uh, snow and emergency days we've used, that will declare the last day of this school year as May 29th. I heard it's supposed to snow tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even go. Now, <clears throat> Would anyone like to I'll remove make a motion any of these to reconsider items and perhaps discuss the snow tonight? <laughs> My 3 a.m. wake-up calls, as far as I'm concerned, are done here. <laughs> are there are any items that you would like removed. Okay, hearing none, a motion? I move that we approve the superintendent's consent agenda, items A through E. I'll second. Okay, moved by Mrs. Hirsch that we approve the superintendent's consent agenda items A through E, seconded by Mr. McDonough. All in favor? Oppose, say no. Motion carries. That leaves us to the next item on the agenda, which is upcoming meetings. And all of these upcoming meetings will be in uh, one of the three rooms we're presently in. Um, which is uh, 162 York rooms uh, 215, 216, or 217. So on Tuesday, April 16th, a uh, Finance and Operations Committee meeting starting at 6.30. On Tuesday, April 23rd, a board, the, our regular Board of Education meeting at uh, 7.30 p.m. On uh, Monday, April 29th, our Board Improvement and Policy Committee meeting at 7 p.m. On Tuesday, April 30th, the uh, Board of Education reorganization meeting um, at uh, 7.30 p.m. The reason that we're having a special uh, meeting for that is the law gives us a certain parameter of the number of days after the election in which we uh, have to install our newly elected Board of Education members. And we don't have any regularly scheduled meetings that fall within that parameter. So we're having a special meeting on April 30th in these rooms at 730. Um, Can I? Yes, you may. The Performance Management Committee meeting is going to be held on uh, April 18th, which just didn't make it onto this calendar. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. OK. Um, and then um, the next item on our agenda is action item from closed session items, uh, employment of employee. Mrs. Hirsch. I move that the Board of Education approve the resolution authorizing notice of non-renewal to non-tenured teachers other than final year probationary teachers. Do I have a second? I second that motion. All right, move, moved by Mrs. Hirsch, seconded by uh, Mrs. Stufen. Is there any discussion? Can I make a inquiry about the procedure here? This resolution is not in the public content section of our agenda. Does that mean that this is a confidential personnel matter that stays? confidential or is there some uh, public statement other than um, Ms. Hirsch, Hirsch's um, well, motion? Uh, it, it is a personnel matter and, and if, if I can just explain what this is. The, the law requires every Board of Education in Illinois if you have uh, teachers who are part-time in this list is our part-time teachers. 
um, unless you intend to offer them the exact same part-time terms of employment next year than you did that you did this year, you have to terminate their employment and rehire these employees with their new terms of employment. In other words, what uh, what their part-time status will be in the following school year. Um, is it fair to say, Mr. Perneau, that the, the vast majority of these teachers will be, if not all of them, rehired, or it's our expectation that they would be rehired? For the most part, yes. So, but the law makes it clear that um, unless you're to offer them the exact same terms of employment, you have to lay them off and then rehire them. I guess my question is procedural. Okay. My question is, is we approved the personnel report and the consent agenda, and it's all public. It says who's... This is not public. This okay. is in closed session. You reviewed the, the employees that are affected in closed session. The only thing that comes out of closed session is this resolution. Okay. And so if you're asking, are we going to name and list all the names in public, we are not, because that is a personnel issue in closed session. Okay. I'm just curious yeah. as to how this is different than the personnel report because we're kind of doing the exact same thing there, aren't we? Not really. But no, this is different because you are taking an action um, that the Board of Education, the personnel report is resignations, retirements, all of those. This is board action to terminate okay. those employees, right. and that puts okay. it in a different category. Okay, I, I understand. Thank you. Okay, um, so we have it moved by Mrs. Hirsch, seconded by Mr. McDonough, and Mrs. Walsh, this uh, would require a roll call vote. Ms. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Moved by Mrs. Hirsch, I'm sorry. Seconded by Mrs. Steuben. Thank you very much for Thank pointing you. that out to me. Ms. Hirsch? Yes. Mrs. Steuben? Yes. Mr. Bloom? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. Mrs. Doroni? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Seven ayes, no nays. That motion passes. The uh, next on our agenda is board communications. Uh, is there any board communications this evening? Mrs. Ebner? Today I attended the Curricular Technology Committee meeting, which Dave Smith spoke briefly about tonight. So I guess it's they meet three, four times a year, and Dave wants board representation at these meetings. So you know we'll plan who can attend the next one for for the next year. I think Dave, there won't be any until next school year. Okay. So anyway, we I attended this. It, it was a really really good discussion. We started with just talking about digital curriculum development as what Dave is talking about, a measured approach of how we're going to add technology in a meaningful way that's integrated into our curriculum. And we started with our strategic plan of why we're doing this. And in our strategic plan, we reviewed our mission and vision, uh, belief statements, our key performance indicators. And within all of those documents, our statements about technology, uh, in our vision, leading edge resources. In one of our belief statements, it talks about state of the art technology. In our key performance indicators, we talk about equity and technology. So the group realized within all of these strategic documents, technology is embedded and talked about that we want to be leading edge. So it, it was, it's a good way to get everybody aligned on why we're doing you know, investments in technology and how it's going to be integrated into our curriculum. That's it. Any other board communications or other? Mr. McDonough. Uh, I was invited to the Kiwanis luncheon. Um, Kiwanis is an organization um, that uh, focuses on children and the things they can do for children. It was a, a great presentation. Um, they've taken on as one of their topics uh, what they can do with the current focus on security uh, challenges in our schools. And they invited a Dr. Lauk, I'm forgetting his first name now, he's the superintendent down in Blue Island, 
and he brought in a very uh, good discussion. He has worked on both sides. He's worked both as superintendent in a couple of districts and also worked for GE, a GE division that focuses on school security solutions. So he's seen it, having seen it from both sides, it was a very frank discussion. It was a great discussion. It talked about uh, some of the things we've talked before with Dave about expectations of a community regarding security and the resources necessary to meet those expectations. Um, they're going to continue this discussion at a future one, and I plan on attending. Chris, uh, you want to come to that one as well? I, 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 it was just a very good discussion in a very small but uh, committed group, and I was grateful that they invited us and grateful that they're involved in the public discussion of this important community element of our school district. Thank you. Mrs. Stufen. I have a lend update, um, only from the standpoint of the, the discussion that we've had um, this evening from several standpoints. One, um, I did go with Len to visit um, Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth. Um, it was refreshing to hear that she understood the complexities of the timing of decisions that we have to make and, and how the, the federal government has to understand that timing um, and that they need to do what, kind of like what we have been doing, which is you gotta start, you, you've gotta continue to talk about the budget. You can't stop talking about it and you need to start making the decision early because there's ramifications and time frames of um, organizations like our education that has to, um, you know, make, make staffing decisions by a certain date, um, contract dates. And, and it was refreshing to hear that. Um, she wants to encourage us to continue to meet with her and other uh, legislators um, for the same reasons that we have been talking about. So that's why I wanted to share it is, is we're, we're, we're hearing that we're doing the right things. We've got some upcoming legislative meetings as Ms. Ebner had indicated and um, we're gonna have to be preparing and you know putting different elements together, um, but pretty much the same message. We actually have, Lend is, is sponsoring, I know, you talk, I, I know you heard about it months ago, but just a heads up that May 1st is fast approaching and that's a lobby day for Lend. And I plan to go, um, Mr. Welton may as well. He's, he actually goes to the LEND meetings um, along with myself. And then LEND is having their uh, second annual dinner and dialogue, April 25th. I know that it's a bad date for us because of our wonderful 60th anniversary of Jackson School. Um, I'm going to try to get to both of them because um, the agenda topics are education budget, PTEL, to Mr. Bloom's point, there's actually two bills pending for legislative um, voting this session. Safety, um, to Mr. Pruneau, you've been talking about the safety uh, up upgrades for us. So I just wanted to let everyone know, you know, that I've gotten the topics that are gonna be discussed, so I'm gonna try to get there um, as well. So I know that there's conflicts with other board members, but I think that it's important as um, you know, we grapple with our issues and say, you know, we've got to communicate the messages that we leverage all of the venues that we can communicate the message through other organizations. And so that's why if LEND invites us to attend with these Congress people, um, we will do that. I know that they're planning um, Bill Foster next. He does not represent us. And I know that we have many different legislators this session uh, based on redistricting and it's time consuming, but it's also beneficial that they hear from many different districts. Um, to Mr. Bloom's point is we're all grappling with the same thing. I went to the dinner, the Lund dinner last year with you. It, it really was a very good, informative, uh, reinforces the message that we're not the only district that's struggling with this. It's actually helpful to be in a room full of board members and administrators who are also dealing with the same struggles, but there were some very good conversations. So I know it's Jackson's, but I think it's definitely a worthwhile evening. Any other board communications? Given that uh, we are at the end of our agenda and there's no other business, I declare this meeting adjourned.